My name is Eva Sufin Jacma, and I would like to welcome you on the on uh, behalf of the Board of direct Directors of uh, Green European Foundations and on behalf of the Management Board of uh, the Strefa Zieleni Foundation, which is the Polish Green Foundation. This is yet another event uh, in a series uh, of uh, meetings and their project uh, Metals uh, for Green Europe. Uh, later during uh, the webinar, we will hear some more about it from one of our panelists. Uh, the transition that is ahead of us uh, and that is really necessary because of the prospects of a climate catastrophe. Uh, we have very little time to prevent it because scientists tell us that we have to cut the emissions of greenhouse gases by at least half um, until 2030, and we must become neutral for the climate um, in 2020 at the latest, uh, which actually leaves us no other choice but take radical steps and undergo a green pro-climate transition, mainly in the field of energy, but it must be supported by digital transition, which due to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has started happening very quickly. We've seen um, a very a great leap in this transition. So we know that we have to undergo this transition, but in order to be able to do it, we need metals. Um, so one of our speakers will explain why we need metals and why it is important for green organizations. Uh, Raul Gomez, our partner uh, from uh, Spain, uh, the uh, director of Transition, uh, Verne, well, Verne will talk about it. Uh, other panelists uh, tonight are excellent speakers, uh, mostly uh, women. Mary, Miriam Kennett uh, from Green Economics Institute uh, from Oxford, founder of uh, this excellent organization, a think tank, one of the biggest think tanks in the world, uh, which studies green economics. Um, we also have with us tonight Professor Joanna Kulczycka from uh, the Mineral and Energy Economy Research Institute of the Polish Academy of Sciences. And uh, she's, all, she's also in the International Resources Panel. Uh, tonight we are also joined by Guillaume Pitron, a French journalist and author uh, of a book uh, War of the Metals, uh, which has already been published in Polish in 2019. Um, and uh, he's going to tell us about his book. And last but not least, Dr. Krzysztof uh, Dudek, a geologist uh, from the uh, AGH University of Science and Technology uh, in Krakow. Well, I would like to give the floor to Raoul first. Can you tell us a little bit about our common project? Thank you, Eva. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank the Fundacia Strefa Zeleni, uh, the Green European Foundation, and you personally for inviting me to participate in, in, in this session. When I heard that the Green European Foundation was going to launch a project on this issue, I rushed to, to join it because I think that one of the raisons d'être of our organizations is to anticipate environmental problems before we encounter them. And moreover, in my country, in Spain, there are hundreds of new mining projects because of the metals that we will be talking about in this, in this event. So uh, allow me to introduce this project in which I think the lead partner, uh, Richard Voters, from the Dutch organization Wetenschappelich Bureau Brandlinks, is doing a, a great job. So let me try to share my screen. Okay, I hope you are all now seeing the, the presentation. Um, this project for the Green European Foundations is about metals 
but more specifically about the metals that will be needed to realize the energy and digital transition plans being promoted by the European Union. I want to make it clear that the energy transition is essential to tackle climate change, but that does not mean that it is not without problems. And in fact, we can define this need for metals as the Achilles heel of the energy transition, of these transitions, energy and, and digital transitions. Nowadays, uh, nowadays, when you look at the news, you can find that there is currently an increasingly an increasing difficulty in, in meeting the demand for key elements in certain sectors, precisely those sectors in which the energy and digital transition is to be realized. If there are already problem, problems in the current situation, as you can see, this is um, a recent new, if in the current situation we are having problems, imagine what uh, we'll have to face uh, in the future if we take into account that we are going to need a much larger amount of certain minerals than we are using. As you can see in this image, according to the European Commission, by 2050, we will need 60 times more lithium, 15 times more cobalt, and 10 times more rare earths than today. These amounts are for the energy transition alone. I mean, uh, without taking into account the digital transition. Uh, an added problem for us in Europe is that we depend on the imports, in, uh, the imports for most metals between uh, 70 to 100% in some cases. And this led us to be in a very fragile situation at the geostrategic and, and economic level. So, what are the issues, the main issues to be tackled in such a project like, like this? The first would be the rapid depletion of certain metal ores. And do we have the right to use all the resources available in the planet? What does it mean for the future generations? We have wasted something so valuable as oil in something such absurd as moving a ton of metals to drive a human body to work. Will we, do the, will we do the same with these metals? Will we left nothing for those that come behind? Uh, the second, <clears throat> the EU's dependence on imports, especially from China. This undermines the EU's strategy autonomy. Uh, if we take the example of the rare earths, the EU imports the 98% of what it needs from China. And as I mentioned before, this put the EU in a fragile and dangerous situation. The third issue <clears throat> is the ecological damage and human rights violation. Because mining, particularly in, in developing countries, is usually carried out with a huge environmental impact and violations of human rights are widely reported. We all, <clears throat> we all may know the situation of coltan mining in Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, but not only. According to Global Witness, mining in Latin America is the greatest, greatest source of social conflict and the one that has provoked the most crimes, in many cases murders, against environmental defenders. So another question we can make ourselves, is it fair that poor people on, and communities are struggling to defend the environment in developing countries are collateral damage in our energy and digital transition? Another issue could be the clash between the EU demand for raw materials and developing countries' ambition to move up the value chain. I'm sure that Miriam Kenneth from the Green Economic Institute will go in deep with this issue later, but we can, we can think that it's absolutely normal that some countries with raw materials reserves want to develop their, their, their own industry and offer manufactured products, and they have the right to do that, but the EU wants the raw materials, so here is a clash that, that we have to take into account. The fifth issue, is the new mining projects within the European borders uh, with the environmental impact and the social controversy that it conveys. We all want to have electricity, vehicles, computers, uh, smartphones, uh, 
but no one wants a mine near their home, not in our backyards. Uh, mm -hmm. But okay, but at the same time, the European Union wants to achieve as much independence as possible in the procurement of strategic metals. And this is going to lead us to a contradiction that is very difficult to resolve. On one side, mining in Europe could guarantee much higher environmental and labor standards than those currently existing in developed countries. But on the other hand, we are talking about many, many projects. Uh, as I mentioned before, in Spain, for example, we're talking about almost a thousand new mining projects and all of them strongly opposed by society. This is important. And the last issue that we have to, we are, we are going to focus to work on in this project is the opportunities and limitation of a circular economy for metals. Circular economy is a concept that is increasingly used, but it is often associated mainly with recycling. This session will focus on the recycling of metals. In the case of the metals we are talking about, recycling them is not at all simple and will certainly have to be taken into account. But in any case, recycling will be not enough. Firstly, because if, for example, we were to recover all the lithium that has already been extracted, refined and put into circulation, mainly for batteries, it would only give, give us enough for one year of electric car, uh, electric vehicle production. And secondly, because as we saw earlier, uh, the amounts we will need in the coming decades will be increasingly larger. When we talk about the circular economy, as you can see in this, in this image, those of us who think that we need to modify an economic and consumption system based on growth like to remember that there are three concepts that's, that must be taken into account first. Refuse, rethink, and reduce. We must refuse the idea that it will be possible to replace all fossil fuel cars with electric cars, which need 30 times more critical metals than, than the current vehicles. We must rethink whether it, it, it would not be smarter to share vehicles, for example. And, and we must reduce the number of devices that are put on the market. We should not replace something as valuable as a smartphone every two years, for example. And it is also essential when we're talking about a circular economy to work more on eco-design. If we think about the subsequent recovery of materials from the moment of design, reuse and recycling rates will increase a lot. And what are we doing in this, in this project? Uh, Regarding this Green European Foundation transnational project, Metals for a Green and Digital Europe, uh, we are going to, we are already uh, organizing 10 events, uh, oh, sorry, 10 events mostly online because of the pandemic situation. The two first of them were carried out in, in, in Spain. And, and also, this one is part of, of these events. We will only have an online multimedia dossier and discussion platform that is already uh, hosted in the Fetten Chapelin website, metalsforeurope.eu. And you can check in, in, that, in that email, in that direction. And our final output will be a final publication, an agenda for political action at all levels, and it will be translated into seven languages. So it will be available for, for all the partners, the, the countries where partners are working. And these partners are seven organizations, seven foundations from seven different countries. And you can see here uh, some of all of them. Uh, as I mentioned before, the lead partner is the Fetten Chapelier Bureau of Grand Links from Dutch, from the Netherlands. We are also Transition Verde there, Strefa Zieleni, of course, from Poland, Vicio from Finland, and, and many others, Green Economics Institute that we have Miriam today as well. So seven foundations from seven different countries working in this project. And I think that that's enough. 
just to introduce the, the project and now it's time for for the real experts uh, to talk about and to show us uh, so that we can learn more about the issue. Whoa. Thank you very much, um, uh, Raul. Uh, could you just add uh, one word about your Spanish events? Uh, what are your projects? What, what uh, events did you have already? Uh, if after you could put the links to those events because some of them were, they were registered in English. So it would be interesting maybe for our public also to watch them after. And, uh, uh, and just um, in few words, what are the biggest challenges for Spain? Because each country has a very specific situation. So, uh, so if you could uh, add a few words about uh, the Spanish specificity of Spanish situation. Yes, I have just shared um, uh, a link via the chat where you can a uh, summary of our two events that we that we carried out in Spain and, and there you can find links to the videos of the entire session in English uh, if anyone want, wants to go in deep with, with them. Uh, the first session we, we made was about uh, the geopolitical situation, the, the why, what kind of world uh, can we find um, after this, this problem I, I've been talking about. Uh, and, and we had as well uh, to Guillaume Pitfon there to talk about this because his book is really interesting on, on, on this topic. And we made a second session on limits and impacts. Uh, we have Alicia Valero, who were talking about the physical limits of the planet. There are no enough metals for all we want, of course, and, and these metals uh, are in small con concentrations. And and we were she she made a, a good presentation. In, if you want to to go in deep in on 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 how much metals is it supposed to still be underground, you can go on the video and check her presentation and about the Spanish situation. Uh, answering your question, here in Spain, we have a problem with the mining law because it's from 1973. It's uh, incredibly old and it has not been adapted enough to the changes that have been in society, in environmental protection, in labor protection. Uh, nowadays, maybe there are some proposals to, to change this mining law. Low. And uh, the debate in Spain is not as much on metals, on uh, if we are going to use them well or not, but only on mining. Because if, as I told you, 1,000 projects, mining projects here are making people be very concerned with the mining, uh, the mining controversies and, and uh, social struggles against them. Um, but at the same time, here in Spain, happened something very interesting, that um, an, an abandoned mine of a tin mine in Galicia, in the northwest of, of Spain, uh, uh, was closed in 1985. And a couple of years ago, or three years ago, in 2018, I think, uh, they have started to exploit the mining waste that were there, led there, and they found uh, the two metals that make coltan. So suddenly we have the only coltan mine in Europe from mining waste in, in, in Galicia. And, and that's very important because it's, it's not a magical solution, of course, because we are going to need a huge amount of, of metals and, and many minerals. But the European Commission itself, they, they say that recovery of raw materials from extractive and industrial wastes has a remarkably high potential to contribute to a sustainable uh, and supply. So that's a chance to remine uh, these wastes and to obtain as much uh, valuable metals as, as possible. Uh, the problem is the scale. Uh, 60 times more lithium, 15 times more cobalt. We are talking about incredible, uh, huge amounts. But at the same time, we have to start for remining, 
for sure, because, because it, the impact is much lower and we have it in here. So in Spain, we have a lot of mining projects. One successful cobalt mine, but that's the so, situation. Uh, uh, I must say that it can be a wonderful introduction to our discussion after that, because at the end, with uh, Professor Kuczycka, we will have examples of how we are using those waste of mining and the extraction industry waste. So we, we will make a circle and we will come to this point. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. Uh, okay. So now I would like to ask um, uh, Guillaume Pitron, uh, why do, did you write this book, Guillaume? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm very honored to be uh, part of this panel, especially uh, outside of France, where this book was published uh, three years ago. Uh, and uh, before I answer your question, uh, I might say that many people who listen to us should be and are certainly very surprised about what, what Raul Gomez has said. And maybe shocked to think that actually in a nutshell, what is being said is that the energy transition brings new issues and it solves a lot of issues, but it brings new issues at the same time. And the problems we are facing with this new green world are just different, but they are shifted from coal and oil industries to rare metals industries. And the question is, how did we, how didn't we see that? How have we come to just discovering right now this reality that has been understood by specialists for, for years and decades? And I think we'll have to answer that question at some point. How did we miss this point? People talk about this story as a dead angle of the energy transition, but that is a 360 degree dead angle and we haven't seen it. Maybe because these mines are far away, because we don't mine in our countries, because we eat finished product and use finished product and we have gained buying power for the last decade, but we've lost buying knowledge. And certainly for these reasons, we are not aware of this. Maybe ecological parties were not aware of this. I think they were not. Some of them were, but didn't understand the, the scope of the issues and the volumes at stake as it's been mentioned by, uh, by Raul Gomez. And now we come up to these new challenges that we will uh, discuss in, the, in this panel. I, as a journalist, I came up onto this issue in 2009, and I was fascinated by these metals, which were already called 10 years ago, 12 years ago, the new oil. And nobody cared about it. And the media was uninterested in my country about it. No one knew really about rare earths. No one knew about uh, gallium, antimony, beryllium, tungsten, uh, cobalt in a way. And I was absolutely certain that that was a very important subject that we would have to tackle for the next decades. It was already seen as a new oil. And I said to myself, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to investigate for six years. I haven't done that all of my six years, but 25% of my time, I researched this story across four continents in 12 countries to actually interview the specialists who knew about it, the geologists, the industrials, and also to go to the field because I have, I'm a reporter. So my point is really to go to the field and to really talk about what I see. And I, and I came up with this story. And I said to myself, when the book was published in France, nobody will care about it as usual because nobody cared about it for a while. I was organizing conferences on strategic metals at the French parliament. I can tell you, nobody really cared. But I said, I don't care. I'll do this story. And in a couple of years, that's going to be important. And people will say, oh yes, there was a book about it a couple of years ago, no one cared about it. but. Okay, we can maybe go back to Amazon.com and find the used book and buy a copy. Uh, actually, the book was a huge, uh, had a huge, uh, brought a huge interest in France because suddenly we would talk about the downsides and the dark sides of this green energy transition. We would go, you know, uh, uh, further than just a green conventional language saying that everything will be clean and that the world will be, the world will be wonderful. With, this, uh, with these new technologies. And I address the question, but where are we going to get these metals? At what cost for the environment and for the humans? And who's going to hold the production of these metals? And who will be the next Saudi Arabia's of critical and strategic metals? 
Will there be wars and armies being waged in the future to secure the most strategic uh, uh, mines in order to secure these strategic needs? And when we look at the energy transition through the bias of these metals, this is a complete underside, a complete untold story that uh, we unveil. And uh, I have a very few minutes to expose that. So I will try to make it short, but then we can develop. But my point comes in three points. My, 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 I want to develop three main points. First, the green world won't be clean. And we can talk about an energy transition, but I question whether we can talk about an ecological transition because these metals that we need, whether they are uh, rare or not rare, uh, you know, we need copper for energy transition. And copper is not a rare metal, it's an abundant metal. We need rare metals because these metals are much more rare in the earth crust than copper. They can be one, two, three thousand more, times more rare. This is why we call them rare, even if we find them everywhere on earth. Uh, these metals are called critical because there are risks of supply shortages, as the European Commission puts it. Uh, and um, uh, the, 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 these metals need to be extracted and refined from the ground, and it comes at a huge eco ecological price that I've uh, seen and witnessed several times, especially in China. And uh, we have no idea about this because the mines are far away, because we don't mine these metals. We have relocated the mines. We have relocated the pollution of the green technologies by letting the poor countries extracting these metals instead of us. And we could just buy the clean metal put them in the green technologies and say, we're clean. And obviously the situation is a bit more complex than that. There is a, an ecology, economic point, which is that we, and Raul Gomez has said it, uh, we need to extract, uh, we need to get these metals from specific countries which have developed a specialization in selling these metals to the rest of the world. And China is probably the most important producer of these strategic metals today. And China doesn't want to sell the metals. China wants to sell the electric battery with the metals inside and keep the added value money in order to sustain its economic development. So the question is, how can we depend, be, keep, keep being dependent upon Chinese supplies when we see that naturally, legitimately, China wants to actually keep the added value of these metals for its own energy transition and get the green jobs instead of us. And the third point is geopolitical. There is a geopolitics of renewable energies there is a geopolitics of the Green Deal appearing under our eyes right now because we're going to have to get these metals from somewhere. Where are we going to get it? Well, we could look in our own soil, as Aru Gomez taught it, and we can extract lots of these metals on the European territory. But also, as it's been said, we don't want to uh, you know, bear the ecological consequences of this green world. So we are, we European consumers in a contradiction here, we want the benefits of the green world, but we don't want the drawbacks of it. But I think we're gonna have to extract some of these metals at some point, we won't have the choice. It's gonna be a matter of mineral sovereignty. But for our mineral sovereignty, we could also look at other supplies outside of the world outside of our borders, outside of the 27 uh, countries' borders, European countries' borders. Um, nickel can be found in Indonesia. Uh, rare earths can be found in, and platinoids can be found in, the, in, in, in Africa. We can, could get niobium and lots of other metals in South America. Uh, Greenland has lots of rare earths and suddenly Greenland arrives on the map because the Chinese wants to get the rare earths from Greenland. So what is gonna be the geopolitics of these rare minerals and then the geopolitics of the, of the green world that is ahead of us? And these are the questions that I've tried to, 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 to answer and to address. Just let me be very clear on that. And that's my last point. We need to do this energy transition. And I completely agree with Raul Gomez and I'm sure with everyone. I'm not a supporter of coal or oil. They don't fund me. Uh, because people say, hmm, he may, he may be funded by this kind of people, or maybe he just doesn't want to have the energy transition done. Let me be clear, I want this done, and this needs to be done, but we need to address right away the cost of it, and we need to mitigate them, and this is what we're going to talk about, recycling, substitution, and also other techniques, circular economy, to mitigate the cost of this green world coming ahead. We need to do this energy transition for sure. And I'm sure we're gonna have discuss about the solutions for making, for making it uh, greener than what, what, it, what it is today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Guillaume. 
I wanted at this stage ask you just one question because in Poland there are two strong fights or debates between the coal and the renewables and between the renewables and the nuclear because there is a very strong movement pro nuclear and uh, maybe in this case uh, what is your opinion is uh, nuclear more green in this case than the renewable energies well that is a very difficult question um, it's hard to answer whether nuclear is greener or less green than green technologies so called green technologies Uh, obviously, in a way, nuclear technologies don't emit CO2. So if the urgency is to fight climate change, obviously, nuclear technologies uh, must be used. And actually, I'm not the one saying it. This is uh, uh, the GIEC, uh, the Intergovernmental uh, Body um, Panel, Climate Panel, saying it, uh, saying that the, the nuclear industry is part of the actions that we must take in order to to fight climate change. As you know, it's going to come up and it's already coming up with huge other issues relating to the waste, the radioactive waste. Uh, personally, in my view, uh, I, I would say that uh, we need to recourse to these nuclear energies uh, because uh, that's the best way in the short term to, uh, to address an urgent uh, question. So I hope that answers your point. Uh, that's, and that's my, my, my belief. Uh, but, but concerning the resources that are needed, uh, but because I, I saw in, the, uh, in some presentations that there are also a lot of metals in the, and a lot of mining in the, needed for nuclear energy. So, so that, that's uh, why my question, because, uh, you know, the defenses of nuclear energy, they are presenting that for renewables, we need a lot of resources, a lot of mining, but as for uh, nuclear, we would need nothing. So, but mm. in fact, it's not the case anyway. Mm. <laughs> we, no. need, we need the metals and we need mining. Well, obviously, and uh, you know, I, I'm not a specialist about the nuclear industry, but uh, for sure, uh, I could never say that uh, you don't, we don't need nothing for nuclear energy. First, we need uranium. And obviously, this uranium must be, uh, must be extracted somewhere. Uh, the French, for example, extract one of its, uh, part of its uranium in, uh, in Niger, in, in Africa. And second, uh, for a nuclear power plant, we find every metal that you can find in the Mendeleev table, including the, all these metals that we've mentioned for green technologies. So they must be found. I haven't had the figures yet in front of my eyes, but if we want to compare the need for metals uh, for the nuclear industry comparing to the need for metals for the, for the, for the green technologies, solar panels or wind turbines or electric batteries, I don't think that, I mean, the comparison would show that the needs for metals for the nuclear industry is much less, even if there, is still, there are still some needs. The real questions with the nuclear industry comes with the radioactive waste. And this is a real issue that must be tackled and which is obviously huge and we shouldn't shy away from them. So I hope I answer your question in this way. Thank you. So now uh, let's uh, come back to mining and uh, we'll be after that uh, to all the questions concerning uh, our main topic of the discussion today. But uh, for the moment, I would like to ask Miriam Kennett. Uh, Miriam, you organized with the Green Economics Institute uh, Uh, recently, a uh, whole day conference, mining for metals, can it be fair? So I wanted to ask you, why did you focus on mining uh, in this uh, for your event? And uh, uh, what were the main conclusions of this conference? What were the participants? Uh, uh, and uh, what, are the, what were the main conclusions? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is a really very important subject, of course. Uh, it's the future, the digital economy, the green economy, um, very important. But it's also our history. So in England, mining has been going on for thousands of years and humans have been mining for thousands of years. So this is very interesting. And in England, 10% of the water 
is polluted and it's uh, old mines are leaching pollution, hurting people's health from ancient mines. So if we have more mines, we're going to have more trouble with safe drinking water. So it's, it's not a new problem. The effect of mining affects everyone, even today. And in my village, nuclear too. So it's really quite a problem for our health. But um, our project was about whether mining is fair. Can it ever be fair? And so we wanted to look at the construction of mining. What is mining? So I want to... I want to make it a bit more personal. Okay, so one thing I want to say to you is this. Um, I brought some props. So here we have gold, okay? Can you see gold? Nice gold. It's not gold, of course, but it's, it's mock gold. What is it about gold that is so wonderful? What is it about gold that says we can mine it, we can take it, we can affect people's health. Why is gold so important? We can't eat it, we can't breathe it, we can't drink it, it's not food. So what is it that um, we want about gold? And that made me think. So several years ago in 2010, I think it was, I went to an event in the House of Commons in England the parliament. And there, there was a court case brought by South African miners, gold miners. And these people brought a court case after many years because they were suffering from terrible diseases, emphysema, TB. Um, I have to look up the word, but lung diseases, specific lung diseases. And these diseases killed them. Uh, slowly and meant that many of their families had no social security, no support and were in terrible poverty. But when we buy our gold necklace, when we buy our gold ring, which I don't wear incidentally, we think this is a product that's beautiful. This is a product that gives value. This is a product a man maybe gives to a woman to say he values her. The family invests in some countries gold on her body but actually, if we look at the supply chain of that gold, we see death, we see illness, we see sickness, we see poverty, we see families ravaged by AIDS. We see years and years of society destroyed, if you like. What for? It's mass, actually. So as Greens, as we embark on, if you like, the green transition and we use technology as a solution, we are doing something similar. We are saying a technological fix will solve our problems or solve our greed, solve our need. We can do what we like, just a bit more technology and we can change things. But actually, as we've learned with nature, as we've learned with the climate, we are part of nature. We are animals in nature, if you like. We are of the earth. Nature is us and we are nature. And by ripping nature to pieces and by mining for its own sake, we destroy nature, we destroy our relationship with nature and we hurt deeply some people on the planet. So in our event, we looked at some of the examples of who was gaining and who was being hurt and how, oh gosh, my computer's gone funny, um, and how, yeah, still there. And how we can change that whole philosophy that we have with nature, with the earth. And it's the same question we have when we look at climate and biodiversity and green issues. We probably have to do more with less. We probably have to think more perhaps like indigenous people teach us that we need to have a better relationship with the earth. And if we ruin the earth and then we go to Mars and take all its minerals, this is not a cure. This is not necessarily helpful, I think. And I must tell you, my experience started when I went to the COP, United Nations Climate Conference um, in 2009, I think it was, 20, COP15. And the Chinese delegate was asked what China's position was. And China was then 
an emerging economy, emerging country. And they said, we've got the rare earth metals. We will win the green economy. We know we will win it and we don't need to comply now because we know in the end we will win with the rare earth metals. So the geopolitical battle, if you like, the geopolitical powers that be have been waging, have been rolling for many years in this. No one will win if we rip off the earth and if we continue like this. So we see it in many countries. What we see and what we noticed in our project is that the geopolitical forces are similar everywhere. So what happens is an expensive, rich investment company in a country says, we want to make money. Not we want to build ring, not we want to make solar panels, we want to make money. And we will invest in a mine in cheap countries, in cheap countries or on indigenous lands where it's easy and the legal costs are low because the contract for ownership of the land is small. So then what they do, and we explored examples of say Canada, which then went to the Okavango Delta, which is one of the world's most beautiful and important natural wildernesses. And they invest there and make a mine. See this in indigenous countries, we looked at the Sami indigenous lands in the Arctic, where somebody else comes from another country and makes a mine on their lands. And the big thing is the local people in general either get paid almost nothing for mining. So they are characterized generally as being low wage and poor, not everywhere, not in Poland, but in many other countries. And secondly, they are offered voluntary sustainability or voluntary uh, corporate social responsibility codes, but they are not offered, the community is not offered a yes or no. So the community has not said, do you want the mine here? No, thanks. The community is given the mine or forced on the mine. They're, often their um, water is polluted as a result. Their land is removed, their sacred sites are removed, whatever it is, or they have very low wages or their health is compromised, but they are not allowed to say no because they have no legal status. And that decision to mine or not to mine was taken somewhere else by others with great power and rich and poor today is huge, much bigger than ever before. So those local people have no ability to say, no thanks, I don't want it. So I think what we can take away from this is next time somebody offers you a gold ring or offers you a new phone or a new computer or, you know, um, all sorts of things. Think about, has a child had to go down the mine? Sorry, my computer's going mad. Has a child had to go down the mine or been a child soldier in order to fight for this, you know, um, for these metals? Often in proxy wars by ex-colonial powers who want the metals and use local people to fight each other to get it because they're desperate. So this whole issue, in my view, comes back to uh, supply chains what's in the product what is the product what is the consumption what does it represent in those people and what is the investment who is deciding those decisions are being made in other countries you can argue some people argue it's the neo-colonial economic argument but it's more than that this is a new wave of huge disparity disparity between groups between economic groups between countries and really, if we really want to be Greens, we have to say, not really, I don't want any part in that. Do I need this product? Is there another way to do it? And I think we need to live lighter. I think it is a case of living lighter on the earth, thinking about even in a thousand, two thousand, four thousand years, is this going to pollute the water of my descendants? Is that good? No. Can it ever really be fair? I think it's quite difficult to argue that it can, and therefore maybe the answer is, maybe we need to keep it to a minimum. But I think we need, most of all, educate the public that every decision they make 
has an impact on life, non-human life on creatures, on the earth, wetlands, I don't know, all sorts. And we need to look after the earth and particularly other humans. It's just not fair. No, probably not. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, it was a strong message, of course. Uh, there was a question of responsibility and our own responsibility inside. We are a part of it. So uh, uh, when we are, we are now uh, working for the green and digital transition, we must not forget that we have 200 years of development and the colonial development uh, also of our civilization. And as uh, developed countries, we have a historical responsibility, not only for climate change, but also for the destruction of environment of many communities in many uh, places in the world. So now uh, it's not states <laughs> that are colonialist, but the uh, uh, huge uh, global international companies. And, uh, but there are some, maybe there are some hopes when we see that Shell was uh, uh, just condemned in Netherlands to, uh, to reduce uh, their own uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So, so citizens maybe will start to, uh, I don't know, to control better those companies because uh, in our economic system, we are pushed for the consum consumption. So this is the system who is uh, pushing us, uh, trying to explain to us that our consumption is for the good of um, uh, all the system and is necessary for economics. And uh, as a Green Economics Institute, what is your opinion about the economic model that is behind that? I think, yes, um, the growth um, the growth model, what, we, what I call the high mass consumption model, which came in after World War II, was designed, I believe, by the Kennedy administration to stop communism because this idea that if we consume, we're not communists. But actually the world has completely changed now and utter consumption, we know is not possible on a finite planet. It's very destructive and it's quite depressing as well when you have tons of stuff that you don't need and all the pollution that goes with it. So that has to stop, there is no choice. This one generation that had high mass consumption made a terrible mistake, which humans and the planet will have to pay for for thousands of years the earth, you know, the seas, the fish, they're all struggling with that. So we have to change that economic model. And the only way that we can survive, and I think it is about survival, is to realign our economics, our whole philosophy, I believe, with the earth. We, we must see ourselves as a very good indigenous speaker said last year at one of the climate conferences, we're part of the earth, we really are, we are of the earth. You know, we're made of all the same stuff. We're made of those, those minerals, actually, I, I believe, aren't we? Oh, and whatnot. So we can't see ourselves as different. We're not. And this philosophical idiocy that said economics was above the earth, that it's not in the earth, it's completely wrong. It's just wrong. It's as silly as saying the earth is flat. We, are, we live in the earth, we live on the earth, we're part of the earth and the earth is part of us. And we must see all our economic modeling like that. No question. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, so you said that uh, uh, you doubt that mining could be fair, uh, but uh, Christoph, uh, I would like to go to mining in Europe and especially in Poland. So now because we, are, we have a Polish event, uh, Krzysztof, if you want, we can switch to Polish now. So we are moving to Poland now by changing the language. So, Krzysztof, you participated in a conference which was organized by the Green Economics Institute. It was a conference about mining. Could you please 
tell us what the metal mining situation is like in Poland now. Uh, and please tell us some um, things about copper in particular, because mining in Poland is mostly about coal and about copper. Voice over to you, Krzysztof. Good evening, everyone. Okay, to start with, I'd like to make some introductory remarks. Metals make for some 80% of all chemical elements. However, it is not related to how much of those metals you can find um, on our planet. There are some metals which are not active in chemical terms. This would be gold, for example, or silver, and some copper as well. Most metals that we know and that we use in our economy can be found in a natural way as minerals. So these are not pure metals. This is one thing. And another thing, and even though metals make for 80% of elements uh, on the periodic table, they are not as abundant in terms of mining. And there are some metals which we do not see as uh, metals usually, such as um, calcium, for example. Or sodium. So except these, there are some other metals which are very rare. We can mine them, but we cannot find a lot of them. It's really something rare you can uh, find. It's like, you know, looking for raisins in a piece of cake. You can find some, but there are just few. And in Poland, we have mostly minerals, not pure copper. And the main producer is a company called KGHM, which bought a Canadian company some time ago. So now they are called KGHM International. And they are a global producer now. And now they are mining, not just in Poland, but also in, in Germany and in America. And some time ago, they said that some assets that they had bought, like um, a mine in um, Arizona in the United States of America, that they want to sell them. But they focus on mining in Poland and in Chile, especially um, at the Sierra Gorda mine, which is an open cast mine, which is cheaper and they are also mining in the desert when there is hardly any rain so you can actually have an open cast mine without any risks and you can have all your technological processes there without the risk of um, of rain and when you want to find copper you looking for, as I said, some raisins in a piece of cake. And sometimes you can actually pee, you find a, a nice piece of cake and there are some raisins in it. That's what we have in Poland, in a particular uh, region of Poland. It's towards the northern east of, northeast of Poland. And It, it, it's called Zechstein in German, and you can find these rocks there. And it's some 1,000 meters 
underneath and they continue towards the um, northeast and that's why KGHM got a concession to mine even further but they are mining underneath so some 1000 meters under the ground it's not an open uh, cast mine and before that uh, there were also mining on the uh, Czech Polish border but they did not find a lot of these resources there and they were also mining in the so-called Erzgebirge around the Czech border too. But like the small mines um, in, in Spain, these mines were just uh, closed. And of course, it's controversial whether it makes any sense to open such a small mine. And KGHM, as I said, is a clear leader. And what are they mining? Copper? And by saying copper, I mean minerals, it's not pure copper. And when we have such a mine, they will also mine sandstones, dolomite, limestone, and kupferschiefer, it's a German expression, so copper bearing shales. And these um, resources contain some copper, but they also contain minerals of other metals, such as silver, for example, or even gold, or platinum, or osmium, or iridium. Uh, but in much smaller amounts uh, than copper. Uh, so, uh, this is actually copper bearing shale, so this dark part, and uh, this lighter part is uh, actually sulfide of uh, copper. And these are also propor the proportions. So 90% would be limestone, sandstone, or shale, and just 2% sulfide of copper or other metals. Uh, well, in this uh, piece of uh, rock, it is blue but it's the same mm, the same compound and okay mining gallery uh, at the depth of more or less 900 meters and the locations uh, Lubin, Rudna and a few others okay GHM mines about 30 million tons of ore every year and in this material in this output, uh, you would find one or two percent of copper and even less silver because it is uh, about uh, 50 ppm. So, out of these 30 million tons of rock oh, through processing, they can extract uh, half a million tons of copper, 1300 tons of silver. And six tons of metallic rhenium and as uh, for gold or other noble metals, even less. So out of these 30 million tons of output, uh, you have to process it to separate uh, uh, the valuable minerals, uh, the copper minerals uh, from uh, more base minerals, which are lighter. That's why the method you use is called flotation. It's a mechanical method. And uh, after that, you have 6% of concentrate of uh, and 94% uh, is considered waste. Then this material, so the 6% go to a smeltering plant and is further processed, which generates more waste, slag, etc., and dust, but of course, to a much smaller extent than it used to be 30 years ago, so in the communist days. And this process of separation of minerals uh, 
copper minerals from base minerals requires a lot of water because all these processes are carried out in a suspension. So for every ton of uh, output of rock, you will need uh, a few cubic meters of water. So again, 30 million thousand of rock is mined and 96% uh, of that is considered waste. And this is actually where the uh, waste ends up in this, um, this is this large sediment basin called called Shalasne uh, Most, and every year uh, another 30 million tons of waste is uh, deposited there, but they claim they have reserves uh, for a few decades of further uh, mining. After some catastrophes and accidents in Brazil 10 years ago and in Hungary, where there were, were problems uh, with uh, such basins because a dam uh, um, was, was broken and some uh, regions were flooded. Uh, uh, KGHM was forced to uh, protect it more to secure it, and now they claim it is, it is safe. Uh, so, um, as I said, then um, the smeltering processes and other chemical treatments uh, in order uh, to obtain different minerals, including silver, and actually KGHM is the leading company in the production of silver, and also Poland is a leader of EU as regards the production of silver, uh, because um, it is extracted, it's actually a byproduct of mining copper. Uh, I'm not going to uh, concentrate too much on the waste and the smeltering process and the emissions uh, you can see it in the diagram, uh, KGHM boasts with the fact that 450 years ago, it uh, generated much more pollution than nowadays and that it meets EU norms now. And they have separate diagrams uh, for sulfur dioxide, for uh, particulate matter and, and, and others. Well, obviously, mining is a huge burden on the natural environment. And the KGHM tries to recover as much as minerals uh, as, as possible. However, in the end, uh, some pollution, uh, some uh, waste uh, containing heavy metals ends up in these sediment tanks or basins. Uh, it is quite close uh, to the surface, uh, so it's more dangerous uh, in the past. Uh, but I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, as of today, this mine is actually meeting all EU standards. In 2017-2018, two-thirds of copper in Europe uh, was mined in Nordic uh, countries, uh, Palo in Sweden, and also in other countries, Karl Linde. Uh, when he visited uh, the workings in Falun, he said, this is what health must look like. And um, in the 17th century, uh, there was a huge campaign of deforestation in these regions uh, to create mines and actually that was before gunpowder uh, was, was invented. So they, use all the wood just uh, to burn it, uh, to heat up the, the rock, the output, to be able uh, to extract uh, the minerals they wanted, sulfates of copper, etc. And of course, then uh, they needed to oxidize it. And they did it anywhere they could, actually in villages, uh, just between huts and they would uh, light up a fire and they oxidized uh, uh, the, the ore, the minerals, uh, 
for this reason, uh, the average life span was not very long. Uh, this is no wonder considering how much uh, uh, copper um, sulfide uh, they uh, breathed. In the situation was no different in Olkusz, uh, in Poland, uh, where they uh, mined uh, uh, the lead sulfide called uh, Galena in the Polish. So it was mostly near Olkusz, but also Tarnowskie Góry. Uh, mining operations uh, are still carried out near near Olkusz, even though the minerals uh, there are fewer and uh, far between. The mine near Olkusz is closed. It is uh, now um, considered a historical site. They have a museum. Uh, but there is another city I would like to tell you about, uh, the Olże mine in Bytom. After the transformation, political transformation 30 years ago, they stopped um, extracting uh, zinc, zinc and lead from the ores, and, but uh, the corporation continue to operate. Now they uh, process metals obtained from old batteries and then other sources. Also, medical research carried out at the end of the 20th century uh, provided evidence that in this region, especially poor people often suffered from serious lung diseases because of mining operations. Uh, and by the way, Silesia is a mining region, but not only for coal, but also different metals. Uh, so for decades, uh, miners had a much shorter life span uh, than the miners' widows or oh, oh, other professions. Uh, uh, so, yes, as I said, in this region, uh, they mined for lead and silver. Uh, then in the 19th century, as zinc became more popular than for many decades, uh, uh, actually the spoils and uh, waste heaps uh, that were left after the previous lead mines were explored and mined for zinc. And... Uh, because uh, the Dolomites near Olkusz are, in, this is this region, it is called uh, the Jura krakowsko częstochowska um, And there is a discussion whether or not uh, they should mine uh, for zinc and cadmium, uh, because these minerals are still there underground. They would have to dig deep it's several dozen uh, meters, or whether this region should be left as it is uh, for tourism. It has actually brought that debate not only for Silesia, because also in the northeastern corner of uh, Poland, there are iron ores, uh, for example. But uh, these deposits are not very rich. It's above a dozen percent. For vanadium, for titanium, it is one percent. But because uh, these deposits are big, there's a lot of such rocks for such some time. Um, there was a debate whether or not uh, they should be mined or, or not. Now, of course, there is uh, uh, another deb debate because the technology has developed. Uh, so uh, these projects are being reconsidered very and uh, of, so with the main question whether or not or not it would be cost effective uh, to mine it and how it would affect the natural environment. So that would be my general uh, remark about mining metals in Poland. Thank you very much, Krzysztof, for your presentation. So thank you for this overview of uh, mining metals in Poland. I just wanted uh, 
to underline that uh, this uh, northeastern corner of Poland is not a typically mining region. It's a very attractive region in terms of ecology, nature, lots of beautiful lakes and forests. It's a paradise, a natural paradise for tourists or lovers of nature. So the decision to mine it uh, will not be an easy one. And if it is made, uh, society will probably not be willing to accept it. So we don't know whether these discussions will continue. But if um, the European Commission makes enough pressure and um, and really pushes uh, for mining metals in Euro EU countries, perhaps the decision will be made and uh, this part of Poland will be will be mined. Now I would like to hand over to Professor uh, Kulczycka. Uh, now uh, let's speak about waste, uh, the waste of mining and the chemical waste. She is expert of this topic and uh, she will present uh, what is the exploitation of uh, mining and chemical waste in Poland? Thank you very much for this introduction. I can speak Polish, so yes, <laughs> no I know problem but... if it's needed. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's perfect for us. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> okay, so I, because I prepared in uh, presentation in English, so maybe it's it's also um, easier to speak uh, English in that sense. Uh, I'm economist, by, uh, but I'm working with geologists mostly. So even I, uh, I have economic background, but I've been on the lectures uh, from uh, at the Academy of Mining and Metallurgy from geology also. So I visited many mines in my uh, my life because that's uh, that's what what was in scope of my interest. Uh, and uh, I really focus on life cycle assessment. So we combine economic assessment with environmental one. And uh, because the mining is on the beginning of the life cycle, it's always interesting in that sense. Uh, but first of all, I would like to remind a little bit what's going on on the European level. So you probably well known what is in this, but what's the particular interest that is, uh, of course, in a new Green Deal and in the new circular action plan, that uh, the critical raw materials and resources are uh, very important in these documents. But what we, what is worth to underline uh, about this, that the critical raw material is updated every three years, but also in Poland, we developed our list of key, uh, key raw materials for the Ministry of the Environment. So we have the whole book about and the whole our own methodology about the uh, important or critical raw material from Poland. The other aspect about metals when we are talking about copper or other metals is that uh, from the point of view of an environmental point of view, uh, compared to plastic or compared to paper is that the metal can be recycled forever without losses. So even not pure without losses, but, but can be recycled. So without losses of the quality, that's what I would like to say. So if you recycle the paper seven or eight or 10 times, it has completely different quality. But when you go to the aluminum or the other metals, it do not lose uh, the, the, the quality value. Uh, so without degrading the value. So it, it's, it's uh, from the environmental point of view, it's quite nice. And also when you're recycling metals, of course, it's less energy consuming. Uh, so from life cycle perspective, from environmental point of view, it's, it's a good point for, for, for metal. Uh, of course, uh, the, the key point is uh, um, compare the, 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 the mining, uh, the metal from primary sources to the secondary sources. And uh, we cannot, we, the, the share of recycling uh, for the demand of metal, it's, 
it's not as high. So we have to mine uh, to, to um, uh, keep the, the demand for the metals because we, the, the recycling size is not uh, enough for, for, our, for our demand. Because uh, how much we consume, we consume really a lot. Uh, what the European Commission is talking, 16 ton uh, of raw materials per year per person in Europe. Uh, of which metal is also a significant part of this. Of course, the most is industrial minerals. And mm, uh, when we mine, we usually landfill. Uh, so that's that's a general uh, um, conclusion from the from the documents, which we why and and so metal is important for us. When we go to the resource panel, we also analyze the uh, information about the um, consumption of uh, raw materials and, of course, divide it in, into four groups. And when we look at the metals, so it's, inc it's the, the uh, extracting has been increasing. So when you look at the 1970, it was 2.6 billion tons. And 2017, 9.1 billion. So that's really uh, a lot when you uh, look at the dy dynamic of this. And of course, uh, when what was already said that when we look at metals, it's not on. We we consume more different type of metals. We need more different uh, types. Very often, rare uh, rare, rare metals. Mm, and uh, what is in policy, European policy, and also what is important for UNEP resource panel, is decoupling. So uh, decoupling it means that division between the well-being and the consumption uh, or impact of uh, consumption of raw materials. And that's the main aim. Uh, and the question is how we can do it. Of course, first of all, we try to analyze it. So to use material flow analysis and to analyze the flow of materials, that's the first point. And the second point is, is to use these um, materials, which is less harmful for the environment. So that's uh, usually, um, uh, when we use the life cycle assessment methodology, methodology for this and try to assess this, this impact. Uh, and uh, one of the point is to use the uh, waste as a resources. So that's, uh, that's the very hot topic in the policy. And uh, of course, the key point is when we would like to use the waste as the resources, is not only to extract uh, these uh, metals from the waste, but also uh, to use the other part. Uh, so not to produce waste from waste, that would be the best if it would be possible. Yeah? So because when we have uh, about um, half of percent of metal in the run of mine or in the waste, then again, uh, over 99% is something else. So the, that's, that would be the best solution, which is not easy. But of course, what, what else we need? We need to have uh, good data and to understand what we are talking, what is waste, what is not waste, what is byproduct, where is the end of criteria. So the legislation, we, uh, in Spain it was already mentioned about the legislation. So in Poland, legislation is updated quite often, even too often. But what we missing, I think we missing really a good policy, a good policy for resource efficiency, a good uh, policy for for this information. And uh, uh, we created a, a lot of uh, inf we we have in Poland a lot of data, and I I have to say that even we have one of the best data uh, about um, uh, database about waste uh, in Poland as in Poland it was introduced in the end of the, uh, in the end of the 80s um, the environmental fee and fine and with this environmental fee and fine which was reported by the company uh, it was also reported the amount of waste so this was uh, reported to the Marshall Office on the regional level. 
and uh, nowadays it is created something like central statistical, uh, what is created like the uh, whole um, central database. So the data was collected by Marshall Office, the data was collected by Central Statistical Office, the data about waste was collecting by mining authorities, and also we have quite a lot of information collected by State Geological Institute. But even to this, when we would like uh, uh, to have um, um, raw materials by raw materials, it's not, it's not easy to have the full information. Of course, what we, what we know in Poland that uh, we have uh, uh, total waste in Poland uh, generated over 100 uh, million ton, and uh, the most of them is uh, waste from flotation, so non ferrous flotation. It's mentioned about the, the this KGHM, so KGHM is the largest uh, European copper producer and one of the largest producer of silver. So it's also uh, about 30 million of flotation uh, is going from KGHM. In this year, it was also some from, from, from zinc, but now it's not any longer. Uh, we have waste from uh, cleaning uh, minerals, so it's mo mostly from coal uh, processing. And we have some dust and, and non ferrous metal and soil. So this is, the, this is the section B, which we are talking about mining as a, as a general. So, so uh, we have the 61 million ton uh, for, for the section B as a mm, waste generation. So, uh, but uh, with the, when we talking about waste hierarchy, we could see, especially in mining and also in mining in Poland, that there are a lot of activities for uh, minimizing the waste generation. It's uh, minimizing um, both on through the efficiency of the process, but also through the reuse of uh, of waste already. Uh, existing so from the from the dump and one of the um, I think one of the most innovative and also uh, in scale of Europe and also in the large scale it's the installation which is in operation in the GH Bolesław this is the um, installation where the they reuse waste from flotation from zinc flotation and uh, they recover zinc and association metal from the waste generated through the last 50, 50 years. So from the tailing pond simply. And uh, nowadays the uh, Olkusz Pomorzany is closed uh, in this year. So they only produce zinc and lead from the, uh, from the, uh, from the tailing dumps, so from, from, from waste. It was, uh, a big investment for, for that mine. This is the near Kraków, so, so, so south part of Poland. Very innovative. The company, it's innovative itself because they make, create a lot of industrial symbiosis. So this is in line with the mm, new the circular economy policy because they use not only the own flotation tailings, but also uh, the uh, waste uh, like dust and um, slack from other, uh, from other activities. So this is one of the nice case study from our region, from Małopolska. Uh, when we're talking about the coal mining and especially open pit, uh, then we're going to the largest uh, uh, pit, largest hole in Europe. So for example, in Bełchatów, so that's how it's look like, and the big discussion is that. But what about what about waste? Uh, it's still, when it's well managed, we could have nearly no waste from such operation like uh, like um, open pit, because when we have overburden, so overburden is not treated uh, as a as a waste, uh, and intergrowth interlayer in the deposit is also treated as an overburden. And when we have selective extraction for, with this soil and rock mass, it can be really mm, well managed for the different uh, main uh, product and also byproduct. So associated minerals, if it can be sold, it can be treated as a, as a byproduct and not classified as a, as a waste. So, so from when we're talking about the mining area, 
uh, it can be uh, really aggregate production from, from brown pearl coal and other byproducts uh, also possible. Again, when we go to the um, industrial minerals, so some achievements in case of industrial minerals, it's also re rational use of, of minerals. And uh, the, the, the best example can be some like feldspar, they can produce rock with very fine grain and dolomite uh, remanufactured and the other processing. So, so even um, in some mines we can have the, information that uh, what they mined, so all run of mine can be used, so no, no waste. And this is one of the, of the best, best examples for industrial minerals. And uh, we go to the Vizuf, which, which you were interested in, and also ask about the, uh, the um, waste, which are from the chemical, because that was mining. Now we go uh, to, the, to the chemical Vizuf plant, which were uh, closed uh, a few years ago, but the steel uh, waste from the dump, uh, which, which is, is still exists, it's still uh, in this area, it's not reused, even it has a big potential for, for this. And a uh, few years ago, we did the very detailed analysis for the waste uh, dump in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Vizuf, uh, just to recover the RARFF element, proposal for recover RARFF element uh, from, this, from this dump. And because uh, this, um, the, this dump is, um, all the time, it's, it has about 5 million tons of waste and it has the, the waste of the same characteristics. So it was the, the, uh, all the time from, from one uh, delivery. Uh, so we know that this material, um, when we verified, is, uh, is unified, so it's not so different. And the, the, the key point for this, it was to find the technology which is zero waste. So not to produce waste, not to produce waste, rare element, and again to produce waste. And uh, it was successful, the proposal was successful uh, to produce uh, anhydride and to have a concentrate of rare element. But uh, unfortunately, even it was successful and economic viable, looks like economic viable, it was not implemented due to, um, I think another aspect, the, the company was bankrupt and the, um, the, the waste still exists and it's changing the ownership for, from, for many times from that time. But uh, when you look at, the, at this process which was proposed, it was the leaching, it was crystallization, rather concentrate, and the result which were proposed uh, by, by chemical people, by the, the whole group of people was really uh, interesting. Even the radioactive was verified and the possibility of different um, rare element could be obtained. But through the economic analysis, the most important was not only to have rare element, but also to have this anhydride uh, from, from, from the deposit. So not to have, uh, what I said, uh, the waste from the waste. So that's, that was the, the key point like this. And you can see the dump, which looks very nice, still, still exists. And uh, the last, uh, uh, what I would like to say, it's quite important that to go with the circular economic hierarchy and to maximize use of material. That's very, very important from the very beginning. So that's uh, eco, eco design, it could be the, the key point from, from this. And uh, what we really need, we need the transparency and uh, the approval for, for such eco-innovation solution, which is not easy because it's usually disruptive innovation. And uh, also uh, social license to operate is not easy to, to, to get this. So that even when you would like to clean the, the area, um, I think that I know it's, I don't think I, I know I can see that uh, there is always a big discussion with the society. So better corporate social responsibility is really needed for even for such uh, investment as you can see here. So a lot of good investment, a lot of good case study 
for a, a revitalization of post mining area can be seen, which is treated all as a tourist area or as a sport area or other application. So we can see a lot of changes, thanks European money quite often like this. And some of them, like Vilička salt mine, is very famous with them. Mm, even now, you can, you can go to the Vilička salt mine and you can recover after COVID. So there are special place where you can go with, with good breathing and uh, recover COVID some lectures. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Uh, it was optimistic at the end. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, uh, a little bit, Guillaume, I would like to, to ask you for a reaction because uh, you were traveling around the world to China, to all those uh, places where there were a lot of uh, uh, problems and human problems. And uh, here we are in Europe. Uh, is it a little bit more optimistic? Is there any hope? I think there can be hope and uh, because, you know, talking about this is, could be seen as depressing and my, the point is really to show that uh, in front of these challenges, there are solutions. And I really believe uh, that things can go better in many ways. Uh, I really believe in relocation of mining. Uh, I know this is a bit uh, provocative to say that, but uh, I think relocating the mining is not only good for uh, strategic supplies, but it's also good for ecology. Because if we relocate the mining in our countries and have responsible mining and fair mining being done by our companies rather than Chinese companies, uh, I think that's going to be better for the environment. And I think responsible mining will be possible in Europe. So that's one first thing that makes me hope that we could do better. And as it's been mentioned before, um, recycling is important. Circular eco economy is extremely important. Uh, I know you have uh, developed, it was seen in the, doc in the, in the commentaries, uh, the paper, do more with less. Uh, this is exactly the point of circular economy. By 2060, uh, the uh, objective is to actually uh, produce twice as many uh, wells, twice, twice as much wells with the same amount of resource. So for uh, $1 produced today, uh, with a specific amount of resource, circular economy could make it possible to produce $2 of, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of wealth. So that shows that we can do uh, more uh, with less. And uh, I, I uh, redirect you to the Factor 4 study, which has been uh, actually made by the Wuppertal Institute in Germany about, about, about that. Uh, so that, that makes me hope. I just want to add that uh, circular economy and recycling won't be the perfect solution either. And we need to keep that also in mind because our needs are evolving very quickly. And actually, uh, you know, the, the needs for certain metals is, uh, you know, growing 10% a year. So if you make 10% plus 10%, you know, it's exponential, which means that by the moment we can recycle the metal, which was introduced in the economic loop 10 years before, 10 years after, let's suppose that we can recycle 100% of this metal, we still need to have more needs, sometimes 100% more needs. So we still have to go back to the mine and we we'll always will have to deal with the mine. So recycling and circular economy can bring part of the solution, but uh, uh, we should not be too much optimistic in my view that it will be uh, the only solution in the entire solution because we we'll always have to dig a scar somewhere in the ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask Łukasz Dudzic to add to our discussion uh, Richard Wouters, who is with us uh, as an attendee. Uh, could you, Łukasz, uh, add uh, Richard to our discussion, please? And, um, and waiting for that, I will ask the question that Richard put in the chat. Is uh, KGHM considering to utilize the rare earth in the copper deposits? It, I believe it's a question to Krzysztof Dudek. Well, uh, uh, rare earth elements, rare earth metals are generally very rare. So we cannot speak about uh, deposits reach in these elements, 
but about some rocks, rock formation, somewhat more or less enriched in rare earth elements. And uh, the rocks exploited by KGHM are sedimentary rocks, uh, sandstones, dolomites, uh, uh, schists, kupfer, schiefer, uh, so copper, be copper bearing sedimentary rocks, uh, which are mineralized with sulfides of uh, copper, iron, uh, lead, zinc, uh, silver, and some other metals. And in such rocks, rare earth elements are not at all concentrated. So there is no use to try to extract rare earth elements, which are very rare and at minor level. So the second part of questions, so where to look for rare earth elements? Such elements are concentrated at the end of crystallization of magmatic rocks. After crystallization of granites, uh, there are in lower temperatures, there are sort of rocks called pegmatites, uh, androthermal veins, which are enriched in incompatible minerals and uh, elements which are such uh, pegmatites are enriched in such minerals as boron minerals, tungsten, uh, tin, also lithium is concentrated in micas, and also uh, such rocks are rich in apatite. Apatite is a um, prime material for chemical phosphorus industry. Apatite is phosphorus mineral. And in such rocks, are rare earth elements somewhat concentrated. So I'm afraid that we cannot combine extraction of uh, copper, silver, metallic uranium, gold, platinum minerals with rare earth, earth elements. Um, so I would like to ask Richard to, to comment on our discussion today. What uh, did you uh, uh, learn from today? What are your remarks after this uh, discussion? Thank you, Eva. Uh, I must say that I learned a lot. Um, let me start with uh, Guillaume uh, Pitron. I think he writes that uh, ecologist parties, while advocating the energy transition, we're not aware of the volumes of materials that uh, we would need. Uh, there are some exceptions. For instance, the green uh, German MEP, Reinhard Bittekofer, was the first to uh, underline the need for uh, rare earths for uh, energy technologies and uh, the fact that we should not remain dependent on uh, China. Um, of course, in ecologist thinking, um, so being the idea that we should not only uh, uh, produce clean energy, but also save a lot of energy by consuming less, uh, changing our lifestyles. Um, and it is clear that uh, we have to uh, revitalize that strain of uh, ecological thinking. Um, but um, oh, for instance, by... by um, not replacing every fossil fuel car with uh, an electric car, but um, replacing every five uh, fossil fuel cars by one shared electric car, we could save a lot of uh, lithium and uh, cobalt, for instance. It would pro probably uh, reduce Europe's need for these metals by 50%. Question is, are we willing to advocate such a uh, huge change in our mobility 
and uh, can you win elections with it? Can you <laughs> can you yeah. have the can you have the next uh, green chancellor in Germany with a yeah. with a program uh, like that? This is exactly the the, the, the main point I believe because uh, the problem is will people I believe that maybe the hope is in the new generation, but uh, but that's why uh, uh, programs like ours and you know projects like ours with the discussions like ours and this communication, the book like the one of Kiom is the book that must be read. It's not something because I completely agree that uh, even green politicians were not aware of how much metals we need. I heard myself for years that yes, we need rare uh, metal airs, but I was not aware of how much we are using them. Because uh, the, the problem is that we are uh, changing technologies all the time. So when we are speaking about recycling and circular eco economy, uh, there are two points. First of all, there is this eco design. So how how products are uh, invented, conceptualized at the beginning, that we must imagine the end of their life and it's uh, for everything. And uh, I'm thinking about buildings. When we are watching all this new generation of uh, buildings for, for offices, there are a lot of metals there. And uh, uh, how will we recover them? How, for how long time they will stay with us? Because uh, we saw with COVID that we are working more and more in our houses, in our homes. So we don't need all these offices. And uh, uh, will they stay here for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, or a few hundred years as uh, uh, a former generation of buildings that we see in Paris, in Roma, and uh, in all the towns. So, so all our civilization, we must rethink our civilization and be responsible where we are producing uh, anything, anything. So uh, as well uh, buildings uh, as uh, all kinds of products that we consume. And, um, and of course, I believe that um, this uh, uh, circular economy of repairing and uh, obliging uh, companies to make uh, products repairable, repairable, not uh, changeable, but repairable. This is maybe our political obligation and some, some states started uh, and maybe European Union must really push on this to make things repairable as an obligation. And uh, something that uh, Miriam was speaking about and she repeats uh, to us all the time at each conference, our responsibility and supply chains that we must not forget our colleagues from other continents and our friends and our uh, people from other continents, but also weaker communities inside the European Union. We saw it with our colleague uh, representing Sami community in Sweden, in such a civilized, uh, modern country, where we, when we think about Scandinavia, we think about everything the best. And we see that even in such a country, in such a big level of civilization, very high level of civilization, uh, indigenous uh, communities are not, not strong enough to, they are not listened to. They have not the know uh, that they can uh, say. And uh, we see it in all the public consultation with, uh, for all the investment that local populations, communities cannot say no. There is a CSR um, politics, uh, uh, they can negotiate better conditions, uh, better uh, protection, environmental protection, but they cannot say no because decisions are, are made above their heads and very often before the consultation is done, the decision is already taken. And this is something that, that, that must be definitely changed. This is one of uh, one of uh, 
big conclusions from our debate. Uh, I, I believe one of conclusions from our debate is about democracy, democracy of investment and the dialogue with uh, between the investors, the um, so the, the uh, where is um, between the uh, common interest uh, of uh, on the global scale on the European level, uh, national level, and this local community. Uh, we must learn to, to have this dialogue, uh, open dialogue, um, uh, honest dialogue, and to let people choose. So to, to explain to them and let them uh, take a decision. And, uh, and there was also something that I uh, learned from, uh, from the uh, Miriam's uh, 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 conference because we had those speakers from uh, other countries and from developing countries that um, what Guillaume is not writing enough, uh, I believe in his book about it, that uh, um, there are countries that are very much dependent for jobs because there is huge unemployment when we see in Africa, like in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, there are countries that, that there is such an unemployment that uh, they need uh, uh, some activity. And uh, 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 it's not only the problem of stopping mining and stopping this activity, but what you are uh, stressing very often, Richard, that we must help them build partnerships to let them develop the, uh, the value chain and produce some of things that we produce in our uh, civilizations, in uh, our societies, let them produce some uh, under products or finished products to make a more fair uh, trade. So I, I believe that we have already a good material for our for our final it's not the end we didn't finish uh, in Poland we will have uh, still a round table we will try to uh, invite as many uh, stakeholders as we can for a op an open dialogue uh, on this topic in one month and after at the end of August we will have a green days uh, where we will have a seminar where we will finish, invite our colleagues, our friends, and uh, we will uh, conclude uh, our uh, project uh, uh, on the Polish side. So thank you very much. Uh, if I can, if you can add something, you can add something, Richard, to close. Yes, yes, uh, to close. Uh, I want to thank uh, Christoph and Joanna for their presentations. Uh, I learned a lot from that. And I was uh, particularly uh, glad to learn that uh, the idea of um, reusing the waste from past mines uh, is so uh, is studied so seriously here in Poland. I think there are big uh, opportunities there, especially if you combine it with the rehabilitation of old uh, mining sites. And I want, just want to show you that there are uh, more webinars on different aspects of mining coming up. Um, one in French and one in, in English. And uh, you can find all the details on the website of the Green European Foundation. And um, then we have uh, this draft text on metals, uh, which is uh, online. Uh, we are improving it uh, all the time. And you can help us improve it by uh, leaving your comments on uh, that website. And you can even do, do that in uh, Polish. We'll manage to uh, translate <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. First, uh, thanks a lot to our wonderful panelists. Uh, thanks, Jana Kruczycka. Thank you very much for having uh, accepted our invitation. Bardzo dziękuję. Thank Krzysztof Dudek. Krzysztof Dudek is our uh, wonderful green geologist that we appreciate a lot. Thank you, Krzysztof, for being with us. Thanks, Guillaume Pitron. Big success. I wish a big success to your book. Thank you I wish you would give. We should give an, uh, a book to each uh, green politician. 
we're <laughs> working on the green uh, and digital transition. Thanks, Raul Gomez, our wonderful uh, Spanish partner. And uh, a lot but not least, thanks a lot, Miriam Kenneth. Uh, your word is always powerful. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thanks, Richard, and bye-bye to everyone. Thanks to you, too. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yes, Thank thanks. You. Thank you, bye. Very interesting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Should just eat.